This week on the Backtable Podcast. When I decided to ditch transrectal, literally the decision was like one day I woke up and said, I'm not doing this anymore. I have the brachy probe. I got a good ultrasound and I'm not going to use a grid stepper. I got to figure out how to, so I did cryo, but I, when I did cryo with the prostate, I never actually used the grid. I completely did it freehand and then I would use a book wall through retractor and then I would tie umbilical tape after I stuck each probe because, you know, I wanted to introduce the needle at biases because the prostate's not a box. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. This discussion is brought to you by Verisite, provider of the Decipher Prostate Genomic Classifier. Decipher Prostate is a test for patients with localized prostate cancer that can help personalize treatment. Every patient and their prostate cancer is unique, and Decipher Prostate can provide meaningful insight into the aggressiveness of each individual's patient's tumor. Because the Decipher score is derived solely from the genomic characteristics of the tumor, it provides information not available through already known clinical and pathologic factors. Decipher high-risk patients generally benefit from earlier or intensified treatment, while decipher low-risk patients may be ideal candidates for monitoring or less overall treatment. Decipher prostate is the most validated gene expression test in localized prostate cancer, with level 1 evidence in national clinical practice guidelines and more than 70 peer-reviewed publications, including more than 65,000 patients. Visit verisite.com slash decipher to learn more. Now, back to the show. This is Aditya Bagrodi as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Matt Alloway, who's a practicing urologist in Cumberland, Maryland, and also the founder of the Perineologic Device Company, which has largely made transperineal biopsies disseminable in the U.S., and also Juan Javier Deslogis, one of my partners here at UC San Diego. Matt, Juan, how are you guys doing today? Great. Fantastic. Well, hey, thanks for uh, spending some time with us this afternoon. And, you know, as I was preparing for this podcast, I was thinking to myself, you know, I grew up on transrectal end fire biopsies. My blocks worked. My clinically significant cancer detection rates for pyrets 3, 4, and 5 were 30%, 60%, 90%. Every year or so, there was a patient who got a bout of sepsis from his biopsy. And why rock the boat? You know, why do I need to change anything? Well, that is the question. And there are two answers to the question. Obviously, the first is complications. Complications which span from rectal bleeding to infections to sepsis. And in fact, in Norway, they've essentially banned the transrectal biopsy because in that smaller country, they had, you know, a handful, five to eight deaths a year from a, a prostate biopsy. So we've got complications on one side, and then we have cancer detection on the other. There's definitely a building body of data that's showing that the transperineal approach offers the trajectory in order to really sample the prostate properly. Because to understand the prostate, you've got to understand that these zones are all sort of like pancaked within each other and they're not it's not shaped like a rectangle or a box it's a complicated sphere and we know now where the cancers are hiding and we know just by simple logic of geometrical vectors that going transrectal is not doing the best job of capturing the disease so those i think are the two issues that in my life pushed me to dedicate the last eight years of research and work and industry to try to change that yeah, I think when we think about any intervention, whether that's a surgery, a procedure, a drug, we often think about safety and efficacy. And in some ways, I'm a little bit proud of myself because I do think you can teach an old dog new tricks, and I've shifted towards transperineal biopsies. And one of the reasons I really thought it'd be nice to have Juan on is Juan's really spearheaded our program here at UC San Diego in terms of moving these biopsies, which were being done by a former member of the department, primarily in the OR, to the clinic. And I thought we could just kind of walk through. You're a practicing provider, academics, private practice, small group, large group. And one fine day, you decide that it's time for me to start doing trans 
perineal biopsies. So when you make that decision, let's just kind of walk through that whole process of making this a reality. One, maybe what were some of the first things that you kind of thought about when you were like, I want to do transperineal biopsies and I want to do them in the clinic? Yeah. So back in 2001, one of my mentors, Dr. Parsons, was uh, kind of spearheaded our transperineal prostate biopsy program. And I had done transperineal cryoablations and some space ores as a resident, but I'd never really done biopsies. And he had encouraged me to do it. He's like, you know, if you know how to do those, you kind of understand how to look at things in transperineal, you should think about doing the biopsies. So I was a little skeptical about it. You know, and as a resident, I had really done a fusion biopsies with the Artemis machine, transrectal. And I came to watch him in the OR. The biopsies were about 50 minutes long, plus turnover. We're doing somewhere around six biopsies in a day if things were going well in our outpatient pavilion. And it just was clunky, to use one of your words. Then my mentor left, went into industry, and suddenly I was the only person that knew how to do transparental prostate biopsies in the department. So I was like, well, how can I make this more efficient and effective? So I basically looked at every ultrasound you could find. I looked at every biopsy attachment. I went to the AUA course. I met Dr. Alloway there. Before we get into all the details. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You had the benefit of, of having somebody who was able to teach you and, and a mentor. Let's say that you don't have that benefit. You didn't do cryos or transperineal biopsies. What are the bare minimum equipment requirements that one would need. Matt, say that my platform is, I have a Euronav machine and a BK ultrasound that I use to do MRI ultrasound fusion biopsies in my clinic. Is that sufficient? Can I do a transperineal biopsy tomorrow? The table that you use, the procedural table, I think is an important consideration because the stirrups, you've got heel crutches, you've got the stirrup for the heel, and you've got the fancy sort of yellow fin stirrups, which would be sort of like the Rolls Royce of sorts. If you're going to start your program using heel stirrups, and Juan, I, I don't know if you appreciated this, but when patients are in that position and they're nervous, they tighten up their legs and they actually push themselves away from you. So they're moving and sliding away from you. You really should switch over at least to the knee crutch because the knee crutch allows them to relax their legs. If they're in the heel stirrup, they have to use their leg muscles to support their knee so they don't flop aside. So that's like really important. Number two, your ultrasound equipment. I mean, you mentioned you got Euronav with a BK. Well, there you go. You're all set. Now, uh, and Juan will definitely jump in on this, but the probes, the transducers, many urologists don't even understand what they're holding in their hand is, yes, I have a biplanar probe. Why can't I use that? No, we're talking about a linear array, not a micro-convex biplanar probe. So you can do transperineal biopsies with a biplanar transrectal probe, but the skill level to do that is quite different than if you're using your brachytherapy biplanar linear transducer. I think I looked at every single ultrasound on the market from GE, Hitachi, BK, to the cheapest $30,000 probe that you can buy. And I can't even remember the name of it. And in addition to that, you really need to be able to determine the difference between the transitions out of the peripheral zone with the probe. Based on the quality of your probe, you want to make sure that the ultrasound is high enough quality that you have where you can really define the peripheral zone and the transition zone. You know, we've kind of, I guess, entered this conversation assuming it's a foregone conclusion that we're going to be doing this not in the operating room. And one, hear you loud and clear that, you know, the time of the procedure, the cost, the anesthetic, all of that is, it's something to consider. And certainly for me, you know, one of my biggest reluctances heading into this were, what if my block doesn't work? Or how's my familiarity with the anatomy going to be, given that I used to use end fire? So what I did, as you know, is shadowed you, worked with you, participated with you for, you know, 10, 15 cases, was like, okay, I think I can like handle this. Then I started doing my own cases in the operating room. Any thoughts on starting out in the OR versus the clinic? Do you have any strong opinions, Matt or Juan? I think the starting in the OR has an advantage. To put a plug in there, I do think that the AUA course is quite helpful for new learners. Even as, I mean, I had been doing it a year by the time I went to the course. And I mean, you pick up on a lot of little nuances that some of the other people are doing. So I think just some didactics plus doing them in the OR would be helpful for anybody just starting up. I would say that those that just jump right in, so we have, you know, I've trained hundreds of urologists and 
hundreds of different settings all throughout the world. And I would tell you that in the U.S., those that start under anesthesia, sometimes they're not sure when to cut the umbilical cord. When am I ready to do this under local in the clinic? The ones that just dive in in the clinic, they actually get over that sort of learning curve of getting comfortable knowing how to get the patient through it. And I think they, they develop a good local anesthesia program faster. If you're in the OR, you know, you always can lean on that anesthesia. So I think it's up to the individual. I mean, those using fusion, sometimes they feel, well, when I trained on fusion, I prefer the patient to be under much better control, more relaxed, and I prefer it being done under anesthesia. Well, I don't think that's the case anymore with transperineal. I think the whole point of what I worked on was I worked and developed everything with the precision point in a surgery center that we own and operate. I have a grid stepper that sits in the corner. I never once used the grid stepper to do the biopsy because I knew that wasn't the path to mainstream the approach. The path to mainstream this approach is we've got to do it in less than 15 minutes under local anesthesia. We've got to make this teachable. And we've got to make this deployable in the widespread urology community. You know, I'm kind of, this is a podcast, so most people can't tell that I'm kind of grinning. And I'm grinning because I've kind of taught myself some things like robotic retroperitoneal lymph dissection, even robotic cystectomies were not something that I was trained on in residency or fellowship necessarily. And as I reflect, I think it was actually moving transperineal biopsies to the clinic that provided me the most anxiety and consternation among all the different things I do. So your cut the umbilical cord analogy totally resonates with me. So I guess that's debatable, depending on your comfort going into this, having partners that are familiar, if you if you want to start into, and also your familiarity with side fire versus end fire probes, I suppose, you could make a decision. So basic equipment, just basic, basic equipment, if you needed this, you wanted to watch like 10 YouTube videos would be a biplanar linear ultrasound probe and a, a grid stepper, like things that your hospital already may have in the OR, or, or do you even need the grid stepper? What, what would you say to that? Well, I would say uh, this may be another discussion point. I don't want to hijack the grid dialogue, but I think Juan would probably agree with me that the grid, first of all, the experience with freehand versus grid is quite different in my opinion. And I think that people think the grid technique simplifies it because it's like playing battleship. Just stick it in the hole and it goes where you think it's going to go. But if you really study the trajectory of the biopsy needle, you're really having to insert a lot more needles to finesse that biopsy needle exactly into that seam. As Juan mentioned earlier, you've got to, like now when I teach, I said, you know, you're playing an instrument. It's like learning to play the violin. Your music is the prostate under ultrasound. You have to read that music. Every prostate's a little bit different. And transrectal was like, bong, 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 and you're done. And there's very little appreciation for finesse and where you are in the prostate. You tend to cluster cores even though you don't realize it. So you've got to be able to read that. And, and as a result, I think the grid is just too limiting. And I don't think it serves a purpose of training wheels to help you do something better in the clinic setting. That would be my opinion. Yeah, I think the grid is the historic way of doing the biopsy. I mean, that's how original transparent biopsies were done a long time ago. I mean, we've made so much more progress over time with the, with the attachments. Yeah, and I mean, the, the music analogy and the finesse totally resonates as well. I mean, the first ones I did under supervision, of course, it's just like, okay, good. I can see the anatomy. I can see where we want to inject our blocks. I can clearly even familiarize myself with a new way of describing the prostate, right? It's not like the base, mid, and apex, medial and lateral. Now we're talking about, you know, posterior, middle, and anterior, medial and lateral, and so on and so forth. So I think there's a learning curve and, you know, maybe the round one or I can identify the prostate reliably and biopsy it and not have things like skeletal muscle or adipose tissue, which I think sometimes people in their early days or a lot of fibromuscular stroma or so forth, that it is a process and it is a little bit more nuanced perhaps in the transrectal approach. Okay. So We've got an ultrasound, that's mandatory. We've got an actual biopsy gun, whether that's a disposable or reusable. Is anything else even required at this point? I think you need a needle sheath. I mean, you know, you don't want to stick the patient out like 20 different times. I know that there's a couple of groups out there that have looked at the disposable angiocaths. You know, I, I'm a little hesitant to use it. When I was a resident, I saw that, you know, there was a 
if you when you resheat the needle through a plastic angiocat, it can actually shear off the plastic. So we use a, a metal biopsy needle sheath, similar to what Dr. Alloway does. I think that's the minimum. Do you actually need the attachment? I think it could make an argument for not using it. It makes it go much faster though when you have an attachment there. I feel like for people that think about this all the time, like these mundane things are not something you spend time thinking about. So, so explicitly, you're talking about like a 14 gauge metallic needle. You've got your ultrasound probe in the rectum. You're going to place that at what, like at the 10 and 2 o'clock position and try to get it to just set the um, apical most aspect of the prostate. Does that sound about right? Yeah, 16 gauge probably, I think. But yep. 16 gauge. Okay. So you get that in there, and then basically you're going to take your biopsy gun, secure that needle in some type of position, which is challenging. Um, I think we can all attest to that, and then take your course. That's bare minimum. Nope. You can do it in the OR. You don't have to necessarily worry about your blocks. I think, of course, if you could do a block, that would be maybe better for the patient. But that's the that's the basics. Is that true? Yeah, and I think you just mentioned the block. We've talked about the anxiety of those first cases under straight local. The block here is distinctly different than a block for a transrectal. A transrectal block injected at the base of the prostate, you know, the old Mount Everest sign, is approaching the hypogastric nerves. The transperineal block is a combination of mostly pudendal nerve and hypogastrics. So the hypogastrics live underneath the pelvic floor muscle. So they're between the pelvic floor muscle and the capsule of the prostate at the apex. And all your pudendal branches then splay out in the subcutaneous tissue, and then they tend to be in higher concentrations, intimate with the muscle. The training, I think, on learning how to do this right, not being too medial, being more lateral, understanding the nerves that you're blocking is part of this whole training concept. So it's really not just about poking the prostate through the perineum. Yes, that's going to reduce infections. But you can do, I, I was working with a group in Michigan and their pathologist said, you know, our cancer detection dropped when we switched to transperineal. I said, wow, really? So I dug in deeper and they were using a grid stepper and they didn't even realize it, but they were basically biopsying the transitional zone. So a bad transperineal biopsy could yield potentially lower cancer detection than a transrectal for that reason. So the training is the biggest monster for us to tackle. As Juan mentioned, you've got these hands-on courses, but there's no phantom in the world that simulates the feel of the perineum. There's no way to learn this other than being in the room with the urologist and kind of walking them through it. And I decided to tackle this at an industry level, which means I've got to try to convert the U.S. and the world into this technique. And these people are, you know, they've been in practice, you know, already, some of them for a couple of decades. We can't wait for the residents to be matriculated through their training programs to make this movement happen, that's going to take that'll take 20 years. So that's really the, the big challenge. And I think the key thing is proper training and support, because sometimes we have to be there side by side with urologists for 15, 20 cases before they're ready to fly on their own. That's a big commitment. And no courses or PowerPoint presentations can make up for that hands-on experience. Yeah, I definitely appreciate that. I mean, it was, uh, you know, I've been here for a year and a half and it took me a year and a half to do enough, kind of commit mentally that this is something I'm interested in, do them in the OR, under supervision, doing myself in the OR, and then in the clinic. So I, I absolutely hear you loud and clear. So there's, we've mentioned the AUA course. Matt, it sounds like you're also available to do some proctoring mentorship. Before we kind of get into some more of the details, any other resources that you guys have found to be particularly helpful on top of that? I think the room, like, you know, you don't want a crowded, tight room. You don't want too many people in there. These are more logistical things, but I think they're, you've got to consider this. I find that a nice room, good temperature control, preferably some music playing in the background. This stuff sounds pretty corny, but I'm telling you, it makes a world of difference. Training your staff to spend most of their time focused on the patient experience and you as the urologist focusing on how to do the job almost by yourself. So when I do the biopsies, I have a clipboard that sits on the patient's suprapubic area, and I have my blue pathology sponges, and I'm putting my cores directly on the sponges myself. So as soon as they're done handing off the local anesthetic, spinal needle, et cetera, at that point going forward, me with the biopsy gun, I'm doing it all by myself. And that one staff member working with me is focused on that patient. So creating a room environment with preferably some yacht rock music in the background makes for a very nice experience for the patient. That's where we get these pain scores 
down to a level that's comparable, if not better than transrectal. So a couple of thoughts on that, Matt. I don't think it's corny at all. I mean, I think like a little squeeze of the pressure bag during a Sisto, I think having some nice Zen yoga music or whatever in the background can totally help diffuse some of the anxiety. So I'm, I'm on board and just having staff that cares and understands that this is, you know, a big day for that patient, even though it may be your fourth biopsy of the day. And, you know, we very like intentionally have kind of walked through like a bare bones approach to transperineal with as much or as little formal involved hands-on mentoring type of training. Now maybe we can switch to more like ideal land. Like I want to do this. I want to do it right. And let's just say you got a million bucks at your disposal. So you're, you know, I'm in academics. I'm going to go to my chairman and say, I've got a couple of capital requests here. So maybe we start out with with the probe, you know, Juan had mentioned that there is a couple of different options out there, assuming you don't have any kind of vested interest in these companies. Any probes that you think might be a little bit more amenable to doing transparent biopsies? Well, I created the precision point to be agnostic. So I understood that on the West Coast, they like Hitachi and they like BK, but you see a little more concentration of Hitachi. In the Midwest, East Coast, it's predominantly BK. But you've also got GE. You have some of the new smaller players, like you've got Terrason, which is sold by the sales team at Hitachi, which has now been bought by Fuji, and GE bought BK. So you've got you know Terrason, you've got the Ariata with Fuji, you've got the BK systems, then you've got MindRay, and you've got Sonosite, which are the sort of the lower cost systems. In Europe, about 20% of our users use the transrectal probe. So it's not the linear sidefire probe by planar. It's actually the old transrectal probe. We tried to do that in the US, but let me tell you, if you've got the money and resources and you have the option of either in the holster or ultrasound, you'll never choose the microconvex biplanar probe. You'll always go grab for your, your biplanar linear transducer. Now, BK has one advantage over the competition. You can run live dual screen. So you can run sagittal and axial live simultaneously. And that's a huge advantage for the new learner because they can start to wrap their head around seeing the biopsy needle flash from both perspectives. When I developed the system, I used an old BK that was called ProFocus. You, can, you couldn't run them live dual because once you learn the technique, you're going to pretty much depend on your sagittal array. And you know when you look at the sagittal linear transducer array, why does it cost so much money? It costs so much money because if you look at how long that array is compared to a microconvex, each one of those diamond crystals is positioned by hand. Each crystal has a wire going in it and a wire going out of it. So it's almost theoretically impossible to make a proper probe and sell it for much less than about $15,000 because somebody's got to make a little bit of profit. But I think it's, I mean, I've had people use every level of equipment. I think Juan hit it right though. You've got to be able to see the delineations between the zones. And I personally use a BK Specto because if, if you've got people coming in, I have people coming into my training facility all, all month. And if they don't have access to fusion, we've got to teach them cognitive. And I think having both live images simultaneously really helps you train somebody on how to do a proper cognitive biopsy. And that's one big advantage. But if you just look at linear, linear arrays technology, I think the Fuji is excellent. I think GE has the new system where they've re-released the uh, biplanar probe with linear. I think the visuals on that are quite nice also. And then when you get it, I mean, you get what you pay for like anything else. And I think most urologists need to understand that if you're going to make this transition, I don't really have users that say, oh, I use transperineal for this and I use transrectal for that. It's, it's pretty much a shift. And once you make that shift, you might as well invest in good equipment that's going to last you. I mean, you want to drive a Tesla or do you want to drive a Chevy Volt? I mean, the choice is yours, but I'd probably pick the Tesla if I could. It's capital equipment and you get a lot of hemming and hawing at the university levels on capital purchases, but you get what you pay for and the quality equipment lasts longer. But please respect the probe too. I tell people, handle the probe like more carefully than a baby. A baby can bounce. An ultrasound probe doesn't bounce. It hits the floor and you're out. You know, you're out fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. So remember that. <laughs>
Yeah, I appreciate that, Matt. And I'm pretty sure if you just showed them a bill from the last Euro sepsis that had a nice ICU stay with uh, with ID and everybody and their mom consulted, the um, kind of financials of it would be pretty pretty compelling. Okay, good. So one, we've decided that we're going to purchase our linear probe. And I hear you loud and clear, especially as kind of a historic end fire guy, the dual live view is massive. So specifically, you can see the prostate and the axial views and the sagittal views as well. That's really nice. Now, you mentioned, Matt, cognitive versus a true fusion. So Juan, I believe you were trained on OR cognitive fusion. Some of it was kind of fortunate that we needed some work on our previous MRI ultrasound fusion machine. And how did you decide that it was probably the Euronav transperineal transrectal fusion software that we were going to go with? You know, when we were looking at it, we looked at Coalesce and we looked at Artemis and we looked at Euronav, which I think are basically the three major platforms. I think micro ultrasound as some sort of fusion, which is kind of like a fancy or, or less fancy cognitive version. You know, the Artemis does not translate well to transperennial because it is a fixed arm. I mean, you really need to be able to move your arm around and have more of a fixed needle as opposed to a fixed ultrasound. Many of the hand motions that you use when you do a transperennial is quite different than transrectal. When we do transrectal, we move the probe in and out of the rectum, and we, we do like a kind of like a twisting motion or a roll. We roll the probe back and forth to do the myopsy. When we do transperennial, you know, it's like the old aircraft terminology. You pitch the probe up and down so you can access the anterior and the posterior, and you yaw, you kind of move it medial and lateral. And, and those motions, for the, for the large part, really the only one that I could find worked well was the Euronav system. I mean, I, I realize there are other people that do it with some other stuff. So for us, I, I think Euronav made the most sense. And to go back to the capital equipment costs, I mean, all the stuff we bought, we use it for space or in the clinic too. So, I mean, it's multi-use. Just because you bought a transperennial probe doesn't mean you can just do biopsies. I mean, you can do the space ores, which we're looking to roll out soon. So it, it can be used for multiple things. Okay. So pitch and yaw. So basically we're thinking about the anal verge as a fulcrum. And we're going to drop our hand to sample more anteriorly. We're going to elevate our hand to sample more posteriorly. Is this correct? Yeah, it's a, it's a whole new set of hand motions, so much so that part of the training exercise when you're working with urologists that have been out there for years doing transrectals is untraining them on the habits of transrectal and teaching the new hand motions. To the fusion concept, I think when I train people on, let's say, Euronav, what I'll do is I'll actually cover the screen, the Euronav screen, and force them to use their brain to anchor the biopsy needle in the vicinity of the ROI, requiring them to actually look at their own MRI, and then anchoring the needle in to the capsule in the vicinity. Then, and only then, I take away the cover over the Euronav screen, and then they introduce secondary motions, and then they biopsy. If you think that the fusion system is going to do the job for you, I compare it to like this. Okay, so we're trying to teach you how to play a Stradivarius. But if you just think that fusion by itself is the only thing you need to know is watch that green circle and hit it, that's like playing Guitar Hero. You know, you don't really know how to play the instrument. It's playing music and sometimes pretty good. But this, you've got to know. So cognitives like a Rand McNally Atlas. Okay, I'm trying to get to San Diego to visit you guys. So I look at Rand McNally Atlas and I drive that way. Fusion's like using your iPhone with, you know, one of your map apps. Okay, move in 200 feet, turn right, turn left. But you've got to, I, I mean, Juan, you can please chime in, but you've got to use both of those skills. If you're not using your brain and reading that music, you could really turn the fusion experience into like, uh-oh, I didn't even get prostate tissue with that ROI. I got skeletal muscle or fat, but if you know how to do two together, one plus one equals three, and you're going to get, it's like icing on the cake to just be able to say, you know, I feel really good about it. Check cognitive, check fusion. And then I actually sometimes like to go back after the needles in the prostate, go back to your axial array, just on your ultrasound screen and look for that flash. And then remember the image you had in your head of the ROI on the axial T2 image and say, yes. That makes sense. Then, Juan, do you inspect your cores? I think you need to look at the damn core too, because if you hit the ROI and it's really cancer, it's going to be dense and the core looks much different than a non-cancerous region that's all flimsy and fragmented. That's that's the way I kind of teach it. Yeah, I, don't, I actually don't think I've been looked at the cores themselves. 
that's a thing that I'll, I think I'll start thinking about doing. And yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. For for cognitive, one of the things that we're doing, we're kind of cheating now. We've asked for access to the radiologist Dynacad software where we can actually just see the whole length of the ROI and how they mapped it out. Because when you look at the MRI reports or even the, they, they just like one spot and they, but they actually the, the ROA is actually quite longer. And yeah, I mean, I do do a combination between the two because I mean, there is registration error as, as, as hard as you try to do to avoid it. I mean, these tiny little sub-centimeter lesions can be very easily missed, even with the with the Fusion software. So I think actually really knowing both really has made my biopsies better because before when I was a resident, I mean, I just was an auto drive. I mean, I was an autopilot, Artemis was going and I would just aim for the target. Now I do kind of a, I do Fusion Euronavs, but I also, as you mentioned, do a little bit of cognitive simultaneously. Yeah, a couple of comments. And I certainly appreciate that perspective. One of the things that was a pleasant surprise is that the actual registering of the prostate with the Euronav if you're going to go with a transperineal approach is not markedly different from a transrectal approach. So that wasn't like a entire new skill set to learn, which I appreciated. And I absolutely hear you. I think that, you know, using your analogies, which I, I like, Matt, I think doing a transrectal approach where you see the prostate, there's very little doubt about what exactly you're seeing. You know, the base and the apex and the SVs are all fairly there. Might be the equivalent of coloring in a coloring book and then perhaps, you know, really understanding the prostate and where the lesions are, are going to be something like a, you know, higher quality piece of art. But it is nice. That was the one thing that was not so intimidating when, when shifting towards the fusion biopsies is that actually registering is pretty comparable. Okay. So now we've got our ultrasound probe. We've decided to really kind of go hook, line, and sinker. We've got ultrasound fusion software and I also got to say, you know, prior to coming here, I always thought that like cognitive fusion biopsies were, were like a absolute tier B option. And I think that they may have more of a role transperineally. Any opinion on that? Well, think, I think Juan hit it on the money. So I actually have a Dynacad workstation myself. I do all my ROIs personally. It's good for teaching urologists. It's good for teaching residents. And it, it, you become really familiar with that patient's prostate. You're like, oh yeah, that lesion, that's blah, blah, blah. But to Juan's point, like if you're going to miss the lesion transperineal, it's going to be from the medial to lateral perspective, more or less. Because once you anchor your needle in the capsule at the apex, and then you fire in the seam of tissue, the relevant zone, I mean, you're, the needle's passing all the way from the apex to the mid prostate, maybe the base if it's short enough. With transrectal, it's an apical to basal issue too. So you've got two different ways of messing it up. If you're too medial or too lateral or too apical or too basal, with transperineal, we eliminate that problem. And so you just plow through that. So when, to that other point about looking at your cores, you know, if you look at your core on a blue pathology sponge and you see two really robust meaty cores, you know that's not falsely thick because you went transrectal and veered in the TZ because the TZ cores will look like a cancer core. But if you stay just in the PZ, for example, and it's a dense, thick core, you got two cores, you know, you, you hit it on the money, you're done, move on, do your systematics and call it a day. If they're flimsy and fragmented, then you might take three or four until you're certain. But you can move from easily from medial to lateral, saturating around the ROI. And I think that's why we saw the results in that. Did you guys read the, the manuscript in the Journal of Urology from that big multidisciplinary young urology collaborative where they compared transrectal to transperineal fusion? So they had like hundreds of men in both cohorts. All the men that were done transrectal were done with fusion. And the transperineal cohort was done in a mixed bag fashion, meaning I think only a, about a third of them were done with fusion software. Transperineal beat the transrectal on cancer detection of all grades. And this was a group of about 15 urologists. So we're not talking like, you know, Juan is, is an ace. I mean, you have to remember that not everyone's a maestro in urology you know, you've got various levels of skill sets. We have to make this reproducible. And I think that study kind of shows that it is reproducible in that fashion. That was pretty exciting paper. I was going to say, yeah, I know we, I read it also. And I, I think one of the biggest differences when you go transperennial is you get the whole, the whole core is a peripheral zone. I mean, or it should be. I, I mean, when you go transrectal, I mean, you can get a fair amount of transition zone in there, kind of a mixed core. And I, I think that that does improve 
the cancer's detection rate in my mind. And then when you're going anterior, you know, think about a transrectal, your vector, it's like taking a pool stick and poking up at your ceiling to get an anterior lesion. But with transperineal, you're flying into the anterior zone exactly. In fact, the Italians, when I train a lot of Italians in Italy, they have the ultrasound screen upside down. So the anterior prostate is, is looks like it's posterior and vice versa. Sometimes I feel like doing that in the U.S. so that people could really study the anterior prostate with such commitment as they do the posterior peripheral zone. Because I don't know, Juan, what your experience has been, but I'm fascinated with anterior disease and I'm fascinated with how much we've, we've missed historically and how much lives up there. It's really wild that when I trained and I was trained on my 12 core transrectal, I never touched that tissue, like never. I mean, MRI told us, hey guys, it's over there at the ceiling. What are you doing down there? So that was a great lesson, but you know, I, I think there's just in the anterior horn. I mean, we find a lot of cancers up in the anterior horn. To get that transrectal, your vector is so biased that you often are like in the capsule, in the tissue, and then out of the capsule. So you're really not getting a representative sample. Yeah, I'm again grinning because in some of my early experiences, I did have a little bit of oversampling of the anterior fibromuscular stroma. And suffice to say, that was never an issue, problem, or concern when I was going transrectal. Well, well, that deserves a slight pause, though. So if I could only selfishly grab a moment and get your opinions. But so anterior disease, everybody thinks it's anterior transitional zone. I believe firmly that no important cancers originate from the transitional zone. I have never once found a posterior transitional zone high-grade tumor that didn't invade from the peripheral zone, not once. And I've been talking with pathologists that still do whole mounts, and they're like, you're right, never seen it. So then why would there be anterior transitional zone high-grade lesions and never in the posterior TZ? It doesn't make any sense at all. Thus, it does not come from the TZ. But where are these anterior tumors coming from? They're coming from the peripheral zone that sweeps, or they're coming from some tissue. And I could, show, I could bore you to death showing you MRI images of these tumors that just seem to be riding very, very anterior, and then they grow into the TZ. They grow easier into the TZ from anterior than they do posterior. That's why they're often larger tumors too, not because we missed them with the past two biopsies. Yeah, I think they're all intriguing points. And I mean, obviously the access to vasculature and the ability to disseminate um, right there with the DVC are, are things I think are all important kind of from a path of, or intriguing from a pathophysiology perspective. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the probe. We've talked about fusion versus cognitive. And now we've kind of been talking without like explicitly describing it, the freehand technique. And, you know, when I would first like hear discussions and debates on this, I honestly was just like, what in God's green earth are they talking about? And maybe I'll give it my relatively newcomer description and have you guys fill in the gaps. So basically you have a device that attaches to your ultrasound probe. I'd say it's maybe about four to five centimeters in height. It's got like a C ring that you can tighten and screw and that attaches it to your probe. And then you've got like a little bit of a sail with little slots in it. And the purpose of that is that you can place any type of needle, whether that's your needle for local anesthesia injection or whether that's an introducer sheath. So kind of a, a conduit to take you from the edge of the perineum to the apex of the prostate where you can repeatedly pass your biopsy gun to sample various parts of the prostate. On the money, yeah, that's that's what I describe it. Yeah, I mean, this is where, you know, I think I can tell a story. When I decided to ditch transrectal, literally the decision was like one day I woke up and said, I'm not doing this anymore. I have the brachy probe. I got a good ultrasound and I'm not going to use a grid stepper. I got to figure out how to, so I did cryo, but I, when I did cryo with the prostate, I never actually used the grid. I completely did it freehand and then I would use a book wall through retractor and then I would tie umbilical tape after I stuck each probe because, you know, I wanted to introduce the needle at biases because the prostate's not a box. So I'd string all those probes together after they were stuck and lasso it to the book walter and then I'd freeze and do my thing. So I thought, well, I'll just freehand it like that, but I need some kind of a cannula. So in 2014, I published and I also presented at the AUA and got, you know, the best of the best video award for basically the, the freehand technique. I thought I was the first to do it, 
but the credit actually goes to the Italians. They beat me by years, but they didn't really make a big deal of it. They published on it. I never looked at the publication. I'm a private practice guy who was just trying to do a better job for my patients. But in the U.S., it was establishing this new technique. Well, people were throwing rotten tomatoes at me at the presentation. They're like, hold on, dude. Who are you? What are you talking about? How are you going to teach this? I said, we've got to come up with a way to make this reproducible and doable through only two punctures. So the grid, you know, you're puncturing the perineum with each throw. With you're describing a metal stacked grid. So it's basically you take a grid plate and you cut every column out except for the one that lies over the, the sagittal array. But you're still poke, 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 poke. The magic was to try to like reinvent this by combining a large stiff coaxial needle with a guiding mechanism to do all these motions. So I think you have to kind of separate, you know, in the pack. I call the the true coaxial needle technique, I call it like chopsticks. So we're back to an analogy. So eating food with chopsticks, you can do it. Yeah, but I'd rather eat my food with a spoon or a fork because I could do it much, I think I could do it faster and a little better. You know, not everyone can learn it this way. In fact, I got an email this morning from California. I can't identify the, the urology. Says, my first 62 transperineal biopsies were done with a metal cannula and the time, effort, misalignment, and mistargets were too disadvantaged for me to ever go back. My cancer yield was also inferior to that achieved with precision point. And then it goes on and on. So, you know, I, that was the problem I faced when I tried to, you know, teach people. But you know, in the right hands, I mean, it can be done. But there are different ways to skin a cat here. And I think you've got to choose your tool based on where your skill set is and what you're trying to achieve and, and really look at your results, too. That's how I would kind of summarize it. Yeah, I like that. I think, you know, it's very practical. I can kind of envision it. All right. So now we've done our equipment. We've got ultrasound probe. We've got a sale, you know, a freehand device. The, I think the one that you've created and optimized, Matt, if I'm not mistaken, has probably the, been the one that's most commonly used. We've decided to do this either fusion or cognitive fusion or MRI fusion. And now it's D-Day. So want to know you to be a very thorough guy walk me through in gritty detail what this looks like you know kind of from the patient walks in the room even maybe with prep enemas all that kind of good stuff and maybe i'll just pepper in some questions here and there some clarification we'll get math input also yeah so i, I you know going back to when i said we were doing about 50 minutes in the in the or now we do one about eight minutes and before I even bring that patient into the room, I mean, we did an in-service with the nurses, with PowerPoints, reviewed everything that I specifically wanted in the room. So the patient walks in, he puts a gown on, he gets himself in position with his legs and the stirrups. We use paper tape to tape the scrotum up. We then shave the perineum, but not the median rafe, um, as I impress upon the residents. And then we use the betadine stick. We don't use any wet prep to prep the perineum. In terms of an enema, originally, everybody got an enema. Now I just do it if they have a history of constipation. In terms of antibiotic use, when we were first doing them, everybody got Keflex or Ansef, you were in the OR. And then I start, and then when I became an attending in July, I just said, well, I'm just not going to give it anymore and see what happens based on the Lancet Oncology publication. And nobody got an infection. So I selectively will use antibiotics for somebody who's got an external catheter, somebody's got a history of recurrent UTI, or if they had a perianal fistula, or even a perianal fistula repair. Any of those high-risk patients, you know, will still give some antibiotics. Now we're getting ready for the myopsy. So I have the um, the nurses mix up the lidocaine. I, I borrow this from, from Matt here, but, you know, we do a combination of 1% lidocaine mixed with basically an equivalent amount of normal saline. So it comes out to about a half percent of lidocaine with um, some sodium bicarb to take off the um, the acidity of the lidocaine. I do a skin block. Real quick, I'm going to pause there for just a second. So 20 of 1% lidocaine, 20 of saline, 20 of bicarb, is that right? For a 60 milliliter total mixture? Yeah, it's about, I think it's um, actually, it's like more like 28 of normal saline, 28 of lidocaine, 1%, and then four cc's of the sodium bicarb to make a total solution of about 60 cc's. And then what type of needles do you have when you're ready to do your blocking and so forth? I mean, 30 gauge needle for a superficial skin wheel. And where are you doing these? So I use the 30 gauge. It's a small needle because I want to make like a good wheel here. I use about 10 cc's on the skin bilaterally. Also go a little bit deeper. What, 10 and 2 o'clock, 3 and 6 o'clock? Um, where are you putting these in? 
10 and, and 2 o'clock. And then about a centimeter or so above the um, rectum, is there a variable? If you've got this, you know, say it's the uh, perineologic device, typically slot 2, 3, 4, broad guidance. But of course, everybody's anatomy is a little bit different. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know if there's a right answer, but I can tell you the way that I've kind of taught myself to do it is I kind of look to see where the levator muscle is before I put my block in because that is where the needle is going to go in the skin. So it's like roughly two o'clock, but I, I always put my ultrasound in and then and then kind of look where where's the levator going to be. And then it's about 10 or two, but it sometimes can be a little more off in either direction. I don't know, Matt, if you have an opinion about that. It's almost something I'd almost have to show visually, but he's describing exactly the way I approach it. Okay. So we do a little wheel and then you maybe, you know, what is it? A three centimeters head towards the later and levator and also anesthetize the tract where your next round of anesthesia is going to go. Yeah. And, you know, we, we actually, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but we recently just switched our spinal needle before I was using a, I think it may have been a bit like a 22 spinal needle or, or something like that, but it was so flimsy. I mean, it would dive off in different directions in the in the in the perineum and i think we recently switched to either 20 or 18 but yeah that you know that kind of stiffer longer spinal needle to kind of just go after the levator and, and bolus the tract before the muscle in the muscle behind the muscle i mean that's again that's what I, something i learned it's like a plug for the aua course even though i promise I, i'm not actually lecturing at it but you know that's what i learned there and i've used it and it's worked well for me Okay, so we get our blocks in, and I don't know if the rest of the listenership would have these concerns, but that was certainly a kind of big first anxiety hurdle for me to get over. And, you know, I can say in my experience that the patients are doing perfectly fine. Of course, just like a transrectal muck or whatever, here and again, you might have somebody that doesn't get perfectly anesthetized, and I think you can just add in a little bit more, just inject a little bit more local. Okay, good. So um, a wheel with a 30 gauge, inject some of the track, then get to the levators. And that's, again, going to be your hand movement more kind of right-left than so much of a rotation. Is that correct? Okay, good. So we've anesthetized the track. We have gone and either done a um, fusion with our software or we're planning on doing a cognitive fusion. And now the 14 or 16 gauge metallic sheath needle goes in. Is that right, Matt? Is this what you do? Yeah, the precision point, I prefer to call it, it's like a trocar more because the, the design is not, doesn't have the dimensions of a coaxial needle. So the it's a 15 gauge trocar with an inner lumen of only 18 gauge. So it provides extreme stiffness because you're asking it to shift in these various positions, but not bend or sway. And the tip is a diamond cut because it's just got to be barely sharp enough to pop through the skin. But once it's deep in the tissue, you don't want it to be like a coaxial needle that has sharp sides to it. Because as you're shifting medial to lateral, up and down, you don't want to theoretically be slicing through any tissue and result in a hematoma. So that locks into that space. I call it the perineal scruff. So, you know, if you have a dog, you grab the dog by the scruff, you know, and they can shift it all over. So we're anchoring the scruff and we're moving the scruff and gliding over the fascia of the pelvic floor muscles in concert with the probe and the rectum actually distorting the prostate to position your trajectory exactly the way you want to fly into the prostate. That would be a simple way of describing it. It's obviously a little bit more dynamic and, you know, it takes a little practice. Got it. And ideally, when you get your coaxial trocar in, where do you want the tip of that trocar to be? You don't want it to be in the muscle. You want it to be in the sub tissue. But the track that Juan describes from the skin to the pelvic floor you're creating a lidocaine tunnel. The access trocar sits in the lidocaine tunnel and shifts in any position. So you don't want the needle to be in the muscle. It's going to kind of lock it and could potentially do some damage, I uh, would uh, predict. But just sitting there, probably it varies from patient to patient based on perineal thickness, but it's going to be a, a few CMs from the pelvic floor. But that's really useful real estate because that's like you're flying your plane into the prostate. You use that little bit of space to use the bevel of your needle and kind of glide into the prostate. Unlike transrectal, which is once you commit, I mean, as soon as the biopsy needle exits the needle guide on transrectal, you're committed to tissue, but not with this. With this, you have the opportunity to visualize your trajectory and say, okay, I'm going a little lateral, I'm going a little anterior, and then you add a little you know, secondary hand motion and anchor in the capsule at the right location. Yeah, I think this is where um, there's probably a, a differences in, in attachments, which is where I think Aditya is, is talking about. 
So the nice thing about the precision point of the perennial logic is the trochar needle is like hubbed with the skin. So when the needle comes out, you can see the tip of it right at the edge of the ultrasound sometimes. And I think that, that is kind of the point that Aditya is asking about is that we actually use a much longer metal needle sheath. It's about 13.8 centimeters. And again, I had gone through several iterations to see what was the appropriate needle length or biopsy needle sheath that I needed to use. So, you know, our, our needle tip, it's like the trocar needle, it's just the tip of the ultrasound because if it's in too far, you can't shift up and down. And if it's out too far, then you're out of the skin. But for the the way that the precision point's set up, I mean, it's kind of like perfectly in place because it's hubbed so close. Okay. So it sounds like no matter how you kind of get there, that needle right at the tip of the ultrasound is um, kind of what we're shooting for. Is, is that about right, Matt? Yeah. And Juan brought up a good point. I try to teach people, I've always used a 20 gauge six inch spinal needle for the very reason that Juan brought up because the 22 is, which is what we use for transrectal. It's so flimsy. It has no, it just, it's flying all over the place. And sometimes you lose track of it. We're doing now a cadaveric dissection to show in great, great detail exactly what we're trying to accomplish with the block. Cause I think there's some misconceptions out there. Like, you know, they talk about the subapical triangle that's kind of confusing one, isn't it? I mean, it's almost suggesting that it, the block is done right under the urethra, like you're doing a space or I actually used to include that part in my block, but now I only do it if I need it. So I do what's called a tap test. So before I start my biopsy and I divide the prostate into four quadrants, it's called a tap test. So the patient's laying there and you're watching their eyes and you mimic with your spinal needle, you mimic where you're going to go with your biopsy needle and you tap the pelvic floor. So right posterior quadrant, I tap medial, and then I come out and tap lateral. Don't say anything to the patient. You just watch their eyes, and the eyes never lie. If they feel any pain, they can't hide it, because transperineal cannot be done without a proper block. Transrectal can. I did almost my whole career, I pretty much did half of my biopsies without any local, because they don't feel pain. But I do the tap test, and then if, they're, if they feel something on the tap test, then I just... I already have my spinal with the lidocaine and just add a little extra and then wait a minute and then recheck the tap test. Plus that also gets you comfortable with the anatomy to kind of see how you're flying in and check your alignment and make sure you're, you're sort of point and shooting correctly. Yeah, that's, that's a great, um, I think you're kind of ready to go, right? You can assess things with a relatively smaller gauge needle and re-anethesize or anethesize further should it be required. And actually, I, I'm, I actually spoke to Juan about this just last week. You know, one of my earlier ones, I actually had difficulty visualizing the prostate on one of the hemiprostates. And he had a couple of good pieces of advice that, you know, it's always absolutely mandatory to um, do a rectal exam. You could have some residual stool in there that can obscure the imaging. Make sure that you have plenty of lubricant between the cover or sterile condom or whatever you may use in the probe. And then also a significant amount between the probe and the rectal wall. And I think one's adopted a technique of actually injecting a lidocaine jelly syringe just to really maximize the amount of lube because uh, some of the anatomy I feel like you know seeing that little slip of muscle lateral to the apex can be a little bit more nuanced than than transrectal any kind of tips and tricks in that department Matt yeah we call that the rectal slurry so what I do is I you know I stop doing enemas okay completely and I've never regretted it now one out of 50 cases you got that guy he's just like he's loaded with poop that's a disaster, okay? But maybe one in 50, one in 60. So for those, I actually just do a dam lavage with a 60cc catheter tip syringe and just go to town. Because if you can't see what you're doing, you know, you're just gonna struggle, okay? The enemas don't really help that much, in my opinion. I mean, I think Wad's got a great idea. If the guy's got a history of constipation, if he'll admit to it, then maybe I should do that. Now, I don't put the rectal slurry in every time. What I do is I go in with the probe first, and if, it, if I've got a beautiful look and I can push my probe parallel to the floor and straight down and still see the prostate, I'm good. So just get started. If I if there's if there's a bit more fo stool in the way, then I pull the rectal slurry, which is about 40 cc's, and squirt her in there. And it pushes the poop out of the way. But rectal gas, now that's going to make your experience really frustrating. And I find that the guys with enemas, if anything, had more gas. Gas is a killer. So I always keep an 18 front red rubber catheter in the row. I don't open it for every case. And we call this fracking for gas. So I like it because it's kind of controversial, you know, fracking for natural gas. So it, it sticks with people. So 
you take your probe out, you stick the red rubber catheter in the rectum, and then you put your probe in underneath the red rubber catheter, and you can see it on your on your axial array, and then use the tip of your probe to steer that that red rubber catheter into the gas pocket to the natural gas. So you're you're putting it through the poop, which is the shale rock, and you're depositing it in the gas pocket of natural gas and venting it. And you can actually hear an audible when you're done too. It's like, yeah. And then leave your probe in and then slide the red rubber out and deposit it on a chuck that I place underneath the patient on the floor because you're going to get lube, some blood, some other nasty stuff. And, and to make your turnover of the room faster, keep a little chuck on the floor and lay the catheter on the chuck because sometimes these gassy fellas gas will represent, especially in the cases you're doing in the afternoon. I find that the gas load, this is nasty. I'm a urologist. I like urine, but I don't like this kind of stuff. But the afternoon is where you probably need the catheter a little bit more than the morning cases. All right. Well, hey, I think that does show that there are, you know, some tips and tricks that, that all of us can, can take away, but definitely super helpful just to kind of maximize getting a good look at the prostate, which is kind of um, the whole experience is preceded on Okay, so so we've got it anesthetized. We've got our trocar in, kind of at the tip of the probe. And um, you know, I do want to be respectful of everybody's time here as we approach an hour. But essentially, different styles out there, but a little bit of a different way to think about the prostate: more anterior, mid, posterior, lateral, medial, and then if they've got a longer prostate, a bit more work to get to the base. Are those kind of your basic mapping biopsies plus targets? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, going back to the our original way that we were doing it and, you know, how we've evolved over time. Originally, you know, the way that we're, you know, our, our program was doing this transparent it was just a straight U-shape, you know, medial lateral anterior, medial lateral kind of mid halfway through the prostate, medial lateral posterior. And as I was starting to do more of them, I, I kind of followed it. And then I was starting to like look at my outcomes and I was, I was like, there's something off here. And then as I was re- realizing that you know, I'm, I think I'm missing the base of the prostate. And then I started looking at all these different types of templates because there's really no great template. I mean, it's basically what people have talked about in their experience. So now what I do and what, what I have the nurses set up for is a 16 systematic template biopsy where we do that, that kind of standard U-shaped configuration. And then I watch the needle in real time and I, I determine, am I getting all the way to the base of the prostate to capture the base of the peripheral zone? And if I don't feel that I am, or if I'm a little unhappy with my posterior, my posterior um, biopsies, then I'll do those extra four cores. And then for the ROI, you know, I do the, the basically the UCLA penumbra where, you know, basically one, one or two in the middle of the lesion, then just kind of the shadow of the lesion with another, you know, total of four biopsies. That's the way we do them. I generally try to do the ROI first in case you do get one of those hematomas that kind of blocks your visualization. You know, I've had one really bad pelvic hematoma, I think in the 200 that I've done, but outside of that, that's my kind of basic system for doing them. Well, this, this discussion of templates, I think, unfortunately would require more time than we have because this is where the wild west is. So you've got a lot of gunslingers out there doing transperineal and we really haven't agreed on what's ideal. So for me, as I tried to pioneer this, that you know, I can't screw this up. I mean, so what I did was I used the the grid saturation data to guide me initially. So those are the ones with the grid stepper where you're thinking 50, 60 cores craziness. But that's always considered like in the promise trial, that was the gold standard on, you know, not missing a cancer. So we started looking at all these different templates, Ginsburg, this preceded music and all that, and the U-shape kind of thing. Ginsburg was a good one. It sort of was like a modified Barzell. And then we just started tweaking. We went from rows and columns to sectors. So what we found, little known to us, there was an Italian researcher doing the same, running the same play. And we both were like, what is the sweet spot? Like, how can I get the best cancer detection with the least amount of cord? What is that number? Now I'm talking no MRI. You've got no MRI. You just got a clinical suspicion. Well, the number was 20. The number was 20. And Dr. Pepe in Italy, exactly 20. Now everybody looks at me and they're like, oh man, you're crazy. That's too many cores. You got to, I think you have to bespoke it a little bit and look like Juan said, you just got to watch how you're flying in and, and appreciate where did I hit and where did I not hit. 
But I do think that we've got to get this template thing organized. We've got to come to some understanding because if transperineal does not increase complications with more cores and the patient tolerates more cores, why not grab a core, you know, between the 10 and two o'clock position anterior? Because actually we find a lot of cancer anterior medial. Ginsburg template, which is the one used in Europe, it includes that area too. I always grab samples in that area, but again, it's a long discussion. I think the most challenging thing for urologists is transitioning from transrectal to transperineal. It doesn't match. They take their little box with their jars and they're like, well, okay, wh which one's apex medial then? It doesn't, it's apples and oranges. You've got to rethink the whole template. And that's where it comes to reading your music. So I think you should, you know, pick a template that's good. In the MRI world, I think we can adjust the, the systematic sampling, but even there, it's a little bit wild west right now. My goal is that every patient comes in and I can look them straight in the face and say, I, I, I mean, I sampled that prostate and we, if there's something there, I found it. I think the overall cancer detection should be about 70%. That includes all pyrads, all players. And I think it should average about 55% clinically significant if you've got, if your template is, is done properly. That's what I've found. And, and that's based on I've done over 2,500 cases myself. I've participated in up to 5,000 total, and I've looked at data that's made me just quite sick to my stomach, so many cores of data. But this is an exciting area, and I think you guys being at the academic level can really contribute to this, this aspect of the whole biopsy. Well, I, I appreciate that, and you know, it's kind of nice when we start moving from fundamentals, I suppose, to refinement, and um, absolutely a lot of very very intelligent, experienced people working on this, yourself included. Well, hey, so, you know, maybe I'll start out as we kind of wrap up here, you know, parting thoughts for the listenership. Again, I finished my um, training in 2016, so blink of an eye, I'm in year seven. And to be perfectly candid, it was intimidating. Ultimately, you know, did kind of believe that there's a lot of value, primarily from a safety perspective, and then also potentially from a diagnostics perspective. And, you know, with, I think, some support from your colleagues, it's uh, it's quite feasible to start doing this. And, you know, in my early experience, there's nothing been, there's nothing kind of catastrophic that's dissuaded me. So I'll start with that. And maybe we could have a thought from each of you, Juan and Matt, as we conclude. My kind of concluding thought here is that, you know, we work many times in isolation. I mean, you know, we were doing the, I was doing the biopsies in the basement of the OR for a year never having actually, you know, really interacted with anybody else doing them. And then I went back to, you know, interact with all these people at the AUA and you can learn a lot. I mean, I, I, I would continue to revisit the way that you're doing the biopsies to see what else you can learn from other people to see if there's an opportunity for you to improve your outcomes. I mean, that would be my suggestion. I mean, you know, work in isolation, get your technique better and then, and then just go back and relearn it again from somebody else or learn other ways you can improve yourself. I would say that transperineal, obviously I've committed, you know, this chunk of my life to this purpose of evangelicizing this whole movement of sorts. But if we look at the experience we had in, in the UK, so the UK, they were doing all grid based in the operating theater under general. We came in there with some fresh new ideas and now 80% of all the postulate biopsies last year were done this way this precision point methodology in the clinic setting. And roughly 20% are done by nurse practitioners. If nurse practitioners, and we're starting to train in the US with nurse practitioners, we can do it. It's, it we're trying to make biopsies fun again. It is, a, it's fun, it's a rewarding, it's satisfying, it's the future. The guidelines are shifting. They've already shifted in Europe. Time to jump in. It's not as sexy as robotic prostatectomy, but in many ways, that, that's how that became successful. Like-minded people got together, started talking about different techniques, different nuances, and the field just completely shifted to that robotic movement. I think we've got a lot more obstacles in the way than the robotic movement, but I can't tell you the momentum that's growing out there. It's, it's really palpable. It's very exciting. And thanks to gentlemen like yourself at the academic level, because the dude from Cumberland, Maryland, you know, is... He's tainted, you know, he's, he's industry, wears different hats. You guys are the ones to do it. So thank you. 
Well, hey, Matt, Juan, thanks again for offering your your experience, your insight, your candor about the whole process. And you know, I think in the 21st century, we all kind of recognize that, one, you've got to kind of evolve with the times, and two, it takes a village. I don't think industry is evil and we're all holier than thou. It's, it's a total team-based approach. And uh, as long as everybody's kind of moving in the right direction, trying to help out patients, the future is bright. All right, guys, have a wonderful evening. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from Devante Del Brune. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Thanks again for listening and see you next week.